In Genesis 2, 7, we see that before any grass or shrubs had sprouted from the ground, God created and formed man from the dust of the ground. So man was existing, but he wasn't yet alive until God blew his pneuma inside of him, until he blew his breath, his spirit. Pneuma Life Church was birthed out of the belief that it is the spirit of God that is breathed into each one of us that empowers us to live a life of impact. Life Church, breathing hope for the future. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. Thank you so much for joining us. It's really good to have you here. Feel free to say hi in the comment section. And if you're new, introduce yourself. We'd love to get to know you. Um, as I was reading Exodus chapter 6, verse 6 to 7 really stood out to me where God says, You will be my people and I will be your God. And it's quite incredible to think that the God who made everything we see all of us um, promises that he will be our God, that he will be with us, that he will look out for us, that he's got plans and purposes for our lives. Um, so yeah, that was just something really encouraging even in the middle of all this craziness that we can just come to him with everything we're facing and he promises to be there with us. Let's pray before we head into the service. Lord, I just thank you for this day. Um, I just thank you that you are always with us, that you you are always looking out for us. I thank you for every single person that is watching this morning. I pray that you'll just bless them, um, that you'll just open up their hearts to receive the word that's been spoken today, Father God. And I just thank you for the incredible community that you surround us with at Numa. I pray, Lord, that even as we worship, um, that your Holy Spirit will just come and touch every single person watching this morning. Um, and we just thank you for you, our Lord. We thank you for your love and your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. Enjoy the summer. Lord Jesus, thank you um, for your presence. God, we come before you again with a song of praise, a song of worship. Uh, we come to, to sing of how great you are, Father, to worship you, um, to adore you, to tell you um, that we love you. Um, you are the only God. There's only one God, Father, and that's you. So come and receive our praise. Come and meet us um, in this space, in this place where we are. Father, you know what's going on in our lives, um, in our situation. You know what's going on in our minds and in our hearts. Um, and so we open ourselves up before you, Jesus. Um, and we invite you, um, come and do what only you can do, Holy Spirit. Come and minister um, to our hearts. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Dark 
Take out some time uh, to pray together as a community, and so where you are at home, let's um, gather around with people that you're surrounded with right now. Or if you would like to post your prayers or requests in the comments, you can do so below. thank you for your presence we thank you for your grace and we just honor you in this time of prayer and worship lord and we just thank you that you are praise and our requests and we honor you for this lord we honor that we can come before your throne confidently and just freely father god in jesus name
Hey guys, we're super excited to see you this morning and also excited to continue in our series, Hard to Believe. Today we're tackling a question that is pretty relevant and timely and that question is, does God just leave us to suffer? Um, we've got a special friend of the family that's going to share with us this morning. Um, and as always, as a NUMA community, we want to honor and respect diversity in all things, including thought and perspective. So let's keep that in mind as we're hearing the message this morning. I hope you enjoy it, and we'll see you again soon. Hi, good morning. My name is Melvin, and I'm married to this beautiful lady next to me, Hendrika. Hi, good morning, everybody, and welcome. Yeah, we, um, we're going to be sharing with you this morning and I've, I've just asked Enrique to just give us, give you a little bit of introduction of who we are and, and what we do. So I, I am the program director, um, house father at a boys home in Salt River. It's called Beth Uriel, Beth Uriel Boys Home. Um, and there's 26 boys um, between the age of 18, young men between the age of 18 and 24 years mm -hmm. old. And our sole purpose is to help these young men to uh, towards independence. Um, but Enrique, why don't you just start us off by just just telling how we how we came here, and then then I'm gonna yeah take us um, further. Yes, yeah. How did we end up here in South Africa? Like Melvin shared, uh, well, I don't think he actually shared. We met um, in 1994 on a Christian mission ship called the Dulas. Maybe some of you are familiar with. Um, we both served on there for two years. Um, from the Netherlands, Melvin is born and bred in Cape Town. Um, yeah, we met. Yeah, 94, got married in 97. We first lived in Cape Town for six years. Then we moved to the Netherlands. Uh, we always planned to live there for one or two years. Um, we were on fire for the Lord and really felt like we want to, you know, go back into missions after that. But our one or two years turned into eight years. And uh, by that time, we had our eldest daughter. At the moment, we've got... God has blessed us with four beautiful children. Our eldest daughter is 14 now. At that time, she was two and a half, and we had uh, flown Melvin's parents over to uh, spend a holiday with us in Europe. And uh, we were on our way back from France to um, via Germany back to the Netherlands where we lived. And it was on the busiest um, day of the year on the road. They call it Black Saturday. And we were driving on the German freeway. And there's no speed limit. It was three lanes. Um, yeah. And then we got, I was actually behind the steering wheel. And then we got a flat tire. And I remember Melvin's dad saying, don't step on the brakes. And I was just holding the steering wheel and the car. Um, yeah, just started turning, uh, turning around. We were on the slow lane and all you could see was smoke. And um, it, at one point we were reversing on the freeway and was going from the slow lane to the middle uh, lane all the way to the fast lane and cars were just flying. It's some miraculous um, intervention from the Lord if we look back at it now. No car touched us. Nobody drove into us. They all managed to you know, with 160 kilometers an hour or 180, you know, go past us. And I remember as we were in the fast lane, I looked in the rear view mirror mm. and I could see the on oncoming traffic um, from the other side. And I looked in the mirror and I was holding the steering wheel and I said, Lord, here we come. Because I thought there's no way we're going to survive this. And by some miraculous intervention, um, there were some bushes and branches that stopped the car. And I remember as we were standing there, um, the, tar the car was a total write-off. And the guy that had driven behind us and really stepped on the brake. And, you know, he parked behind us and he checked if we were all okay. And he said, oh, you're lucky, you're lucky, you're so lucky. And we realized that, no, we're not lucky. God had, had spared our life and mm. had given us a second chance. And um, I remember also that the, 
police, the police came, there was even a local film crew, the ambulance came, the firefighters came, because they thought nobody would survive um, that on that day, uh, a crash like that. And they were amazed that the car was a total write-off, it was a wreck, but we were fine. Mm. We had no harms, no scars. And I remember standing there with all the cars flying past us and we looked at each other and we said, you know, God has given us a second chance in life. What are we gonna do with it? And right there, we we looked at each other and we both knew, you know, we need to go back into missions. We need to go back into serving the Lord and yes, actually stop living for ourselves. And um, yeah, that was, um, that journey back into missions hasn't been an easy journey. We've faced um, a lot of opposition. Um, yeah, it's, we've, yeah, I would almost say we have suffered. We've been back in South Africa serving at Bethurial for the last 10 years. Yeah. But I remember especially the first um, five or six years of our time there, we faced so much opposition. Mm. Um, yeah, people, um, yeah, they, they spread lies about us. They um, made life very difficult for us. And we faced many times that we thought, Lord, we we can't, we can't continue anymore. This is too heavy for us. This mm. is, um, and each time where we thought we were ready to, to move back to, to the Netherlands, that we really were seeking the Lord, you know, just for him to confirm. And each time he would comfort us and he would speak to us so clearly from his word and he would um, yeah, lead and guide us. Mm. And for us, I mean, we are, 10 years later and it's really by God's mercy and by his grace um, yeah, that we are still going it's it's not by our own strength but mm. truly by his strength and for us I think if I look back um, yeah we've faced lots of spiritual warfare and uh, we shouldn't forget often God gets the blame for suffering but we shouldn't forget that we have an enemy as well who is out to rob steal and destroy and he wants to break us he wants to yeah really wants to harm us and mm. i think those are the things in life that get us gets us down um and what what i can say um, what we've experienced over the last 10 years and even before that from just living with the lord that he doesn't promise that it's gonna be a smooth journey but like it says in psalm 23 he promises that when we go through the valley of the shadow of death, that he will be with us and that he will be our guide. He is our comforter. He is our provider. He is our healer. And that is what we've experienced. And um, yeah, um, yeah, he's a miracle worker and he can make beauty uh, come from ashes. And I think that's really um if we also think of the, the lives of the boys at the home, they all come from, from broken backgrounds mm. where often the fathers haven't been present. But to know that God wants to be the heavenly father and our desire has always been um, for them to know the truth and the truth will set them free. And that's not a guarantee for an easy life, but it is a life I can't imagine living any different uh, than what we've been doing. And yeah, so I just wanted to end up, uh, end off with what the enemy um, yeah, intends for harm to break and destroy us. The Lord will use it for good and he will turn that around for good. So yeah. that's what I really wanted to share with you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Andrika. So I'm, I'm going to continue by reading uh, just a few verses from the Bible and then going to attempt to answer some questions, um, you know, that um, that is relevant for the time that we live in. Um, and, and the questions I'm going to answer is, um, I'm going to try and, and, and answer three questions um, relating to suffering. Um, but I want to talk about a, a person that actually also um, came to Jesus um, you know, and he had a question and um, when Jesus answered him, he couldn't understand. And I guess that's how we feel many times when we um, 
when we come to God and ask Him uh, certain, or, or when we have these questions, we don't necessarily come to God, but as as an unbeliever or as a Christian, um, you know, when things happen and it's it's not what is normal in our lives, we we basically have these questions and, and we cannot answer them. or We don't know what the answers are to these questions. Um, but, you know, uh, and, and it's pretty normal um, because uh, the person that I'm going to talk about today, his name is Nicodemus. Um, Nicodemus, um, you know, was a ruler. He was a leader. He was a Pharisee. A Pharisee, um, um, somebody that was well educated, respected. Um, you know, he was a he was a, a very important person in the time of Jesus. So he came to Jesus by night. It starts out that he came to Jesus by night. Um, and and you'll see when we when we read the story, uh, you know, he could have come to Jesus any time because you know he was a very important person. But um, he came to Jesus not as a um, you know to represent the party or the group that he belonged to, which were um, you know as it says they were. Um, he was a counselor, a Jewish, he was, he was part of, he was a member of the Jewish council, in the ruling council. Um, so he came to Jesus in his personal capacity and, and he was sincere when he came to Jesus um, because he really was struggling with something, um, um, you know, because their job as, as the ruling council was to actually stop anybody that comes into um into the city or um and and that, that are coming to proclaim something you know uh, so so to to them jesus was um was a threat because he came into jerusalem or he came in on the scene and there were many people following him and you know and so that that was quite a quite a um, alarming thing at the time um so nicodemus uh, you know didn't come in that capacity when he came to jesus but let me just read to you first a uh, few verses in in chapter three um now there was a man um a pharisee named nicodemus a member of the jewish ruling council um, he, he came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher. Now I need to just stop there. He actually, he actually um, addresses Jesus with a term which he would have been uh, addressed with. And, and yes, he... he actually um, earned that. You know, it would be like... Um, so in today's term, you know, somebody that works at university, um, he uh, might be the gardener, um, but that doesn't make him a professor. Um, but yes, he works at the same place as professor, uh, but a professor um, is there, or lecturer is there because he has studied and he's got the authority to actually teach. Um, I don't know if you, if you get what I'm trying to say is that um, Nicodemus, he was a rabbi. He was a teacher, um, you know, of the of the Jewish scriptures. Um, but Jesus was just an ordinary guy, um, you know, the son of a carpenter. And, you know, uh, was uh, he was 30 years old when he started, um, you know, his ministry. Um, and never went to, um, you know, he wasn't a Pharisee who never went to college like Nicodemus did. So he would never have been um, addressed as a rabbi. Um, but obviously Nicodemus um, knew something about Jesus. And that's why he came to Jesus. Um, because he, he and, and let's just see what he says next. He says, for no one could, um, this is Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. So he acknowledges that Jesus 
is um, somebody that was sent from God. And then secondly, um, he actually says, for no one can perform the miraculous signs so, um, that you were doing if God was not with you. Um, so Jesus was healing uh, people that were sick. He was, um, and he had many followers. Um, so, so Nicodemus actually um, wanted to just, um, you know, acknowledge that. And, and, and you know, um, Jesus then in verse 3 actually um, says to Nicodemus, I tell you the truth that no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Now, that was a, a very straightforward uh, response, but it was a very difficult one. You know, even for Nicodemus, who was a, a well-educated person, he couldn't understand what, what is Jesus trying to say. For somebody to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. And his response to Jesus was, how can that be? How can I go back into my mother's womb? And and as an adult, as a grown man, how can I go back into my mother's womb and be born again? Um, you know, but Jesus was talking about a different kind of birth, you know, of rebirth. He was talking about a spiritual uh, rebirth. And, and, and Jesus basically, um, you know, because he would have, because of his um, background, um, we would have expected for him to actually know what Jesus is talking about. Um, because Jesus actually, uh, Jesus actually speak to him about that where he says in 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 in, um, in verse ten he says you are you are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things. I tell you the truth, truth we speak of what we know, and we testify of what we've seen, but still people do not accept our testimony. Um, so basically, Jesus says, you know what, um, if there was anyone, you know, uh, that would have known what I was saying, it should have been you, Nicodemus, but he couldn't understand it. Um, you know, I think um, what I want to say is that um, often, you know, in life and especially in the time that we live now, we, we have questions. Um, very burning questions that we ask um, you know why does God allow things to happen why does God um, you know allow suffering you know does God turn his back on us um, and and just allow us to suffer and I want to answer that question um, you know or, or actually in three different um, sort of, um, I want to look at three um, different um, ways to answer that question. And the first one was would be um, where in the Bible can we actually see that God has responded to or identified with human suffering? Um, but that brings me basically to a story in the Old Testament. Um, a guy named Joseph. Joseph was a, a it was a, it was a, he, he had many brothers. Um, grew up in a big family, um, and but he was loved by his father. He was uh, the Bible actually says that he was one of. Um, uh, his father loved him and his brothers were really jealous about him because um, Joseph also had a special gift. He was a dreamer and he could interpret dreams. So jo Joseph basically um, said um, to uh, to his brothers, oh, he, when he had a dream, he actually um, told his brothers um, uh, what this dream meant and they really really got angry with him um, to the effect that they actually um, uh, staged his um, a plot against him where they basically took him into um, with him one day when they went to um, sort of when they went into the fields um, and then they plotted against him they 
threw him in a pit um, and they took the clothes that he had on and they basically said to his father that he was killed because they put blood on, the, on, his, clo on his clothes um, and then they sold him uh, into slavery uh, into Egypt. Um, and what I like about this story is that um, is that Joseph actually, uh, you know, he suffered because he was separated from his family and because of uh, the jealousy from his brothers. Um, he, 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 he was separated from his father and his mother and, and, and he was taken into a, a foreign land. But uh, Joseph, he never lost faith. You know, he kept trusting God to the point where because of the gift that he had um, dreaming he um, he based, and, and also interpreting dreams he became a very important person in, in, in Egypt even so important that um, you know there was the pharaoh who was the the king and then Joseph was the second person after the king um, and the bible says in that time there was a famine uh, People were dying because of hunger. But Joseph, uh, the king had a dream and Joseph interpreted. Um, and it was actually predicting what was going to happen. There was seven years of, 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 of a lot of food. And there was a seven years of, of no food, which is just this time the famine. Um, and because he interpreted that dream, um, the king actually made him in charge of, of all the food in the country. And and so when the famine came, Egypt, they didn't have a problem. Um, but in, in, in Canaan, um, uh, where his brothers grew up um, with their father, um, who thought that his son was dead, um, they had to go look for food. And they came as far as Egypt. Um, and they didn't recognize their brother. Um, and then uh, they were they were asking for food. And Joseph, when he saw them, he recognized them. Um, you know, and eventually he um, tell them who he is. And he says, go fetch our father and our family and bring them. And, and God actually used that suffering or that... Um, um, you know, he's a, God actually responded to um, to that suffering, that moment of suffering that uh, that that Joseph was going through, um, because he had a purpose. He had a a purpose for. Um, he allowed uh, Joseph to be captured or to be taken away from his family because he knew that in the future that the same Joseph was going to be a rescue for his family. Um, and now the, the second question um, that, I, that, I, that I'm thinking that I would like to answer is that why is there suffering? Um, in the Romans 5, um, verse, um, in the Romans 5, verse 3, it says that not so, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perse perseverance why is there suffering there is suffering because um, it builds up character it helps us to um, to to go through life um, you know it, it teaches us um, you know to persevere uh, Romans 8 verse 18 also says, I consider that our present suffering are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. In other words, um, you know, there is suffering in our, in our lives because we can actually, um, we can actually one day uh, when we get through on the other side, like, like Joseph, um, you know, it can become a blessing, um, you know, where, um, where you've learned from the experiences that you've gone through the difficult time. Um, similar, you know, uh, the Bible talks about, um, you know, Jesus when 
in later in 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 his in his journey, you know, because his whole purpose on on this earth was to to come and be a sacrifice for our sins, um, you know, to die on the cross of Calvary, um, so that we can be forgiven. Um, and it wasn't an easy task, um, you know. There was a, when Jesus was praying in the garden, he basically said, "Let this." Up, um, that it that it will go past him, um, you know, because he knew that um, when if he um, when he was crucified, when he was going to die on the cross of Calvary, that there was going to come a moment where he would feel really alone, and it was at that moment, in his darkest moment, it was. The Bible says that um, he he cried out um, in his darkest moment. In, in his mother tongue, which was Aramaic, um, he said, Eloi, Eloi lama sabachthani, um, which uh, was translated as, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, you know, Jesus had to identify with um, what it felt like, um, you know, because Jesus was perfect God. He was perfect man, um, you know, and at that time, he really felt like, like he was alone, like God has, has turned his back on him. Um, but it wasn't that God turned his back on Jesus. He basically turned his back on the sin that Jesus took upon him, which was my sin. It was your sin. Um, it is our sin that Jesus took upon him at that time so that we can be forgiven. So, um, you know, why... Why is this suffering? Because it helps us, you know, as it says in the Romans 5 verse 3, um, that we know that the suffering that we go through, um, when we go through difficult times, that it will, that it produces perseverance. It makes us strong. Um, you know, the last question, the last question that I want to answer um, concerning suffering is, um, what does what does it look like for God to pre to be present in our suffering, and how um, and how does He how does that aid us? Um, what does it look like for God to be present in our suffering, and what does it? It is actually just um, you know you know just come back again to what I just shared about Jesus dying on the cross of Calvary for our sin. Um, you know, at that moment, the Bible says in another part of, of the Bible, uh, in Ephesians, Ephesians 5 verse 2, um, you know, it, it talks about the suffering of Christ, um, it, that it was a sweet aroma to God the Father. Um, so Christ's suffering, um, it says Christ loved us. Uh, and gave himself up for us in Ephesians 5 verse 2 as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Christ loved us so much. Um, it says in John 3 verse 16, you know, in that same chapter where Nicodemus came to, 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 to Jesus, John um, is now speaking, um, you know, um, and he says this, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, shall not go lost, but will have eternal life. Um, you know, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to, to save so that the world can be saved through him. Um, so that question, what does it look like for God to be present in our suffering? You know, when Jesus hung there on that cross and he said, My God, my God, for, um, why have thou forsaken me? It was at that moment, you know, when Jesus in the form of man, but also truly God, um, you know, knew what it's like when we go through a difficult time. When we go through a time of, 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 of not understanding uh, why things happen and why we're we going through these kind of things. Why, um, you know, uh, I think everything that Jesus did on, on this earth was, you know, there was a reason 
and everything that he spoke about, you know, was a reason for us, you know, to, to so that we can relate to, um, you know, to, to what it's like, um, you know, for us uh, when we go through these difficult times, um, you know, so that, um, so that we can, that we can know that he actually knows what it's like because he's been there. Um, you know, so when, when Nicodemus came to Jesus, I guess, you know, he was representing us. Um, we often come with difficult questions. We often come with easy questions. We come with questions. We come with questions. Um, and, you know, um, and one of the questions, um, you know, that we looked at tonight, to, to, to this morning, you know, today, um, is, you know, does God turn his back on us and, and allow us to suffer? Um, you know, I, I don't think so, because he says in Hebrews 13 verse 5 that he will never leave us nor forsake us, God. He will be there with us all the time, you know, and, and, and when Nicodemus came and asked this question, he found forgiveness because later on, you know, we see that at the time when Jesus was crucified, um, it says in John 19 verse 39, that Nicodemus was there, you know, he brought expensive spices um, to the burial of Jesus. Um, and I believe because he came to Jesus at night to ask that question, he found the answers um, to his life and he found salvation. He found uh, redemption. He found forgiveness for his sin. Um, I want to say to you today that if you have questions, and if you come to God today with questions, that he is there to answer you. You know, just like he answered Nicodemus. And sometimes we don't understand what he's saying. Um, you know, we, we don't grasp it, um, you know. Um, but uh, but he, he does care about us, and I just want to pray for us. This morning, and I want to ask God to help us. Um, you know, especially um, when we come to Him with questions, and we we ask Him, um, you know, uh, and then He answers us. Really simple, you know. In, in in five words, you must be born again. Jesus loves you, cares about you, loves you so much that He gave His own life for you. Father, I just, I just want to pray. Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, for this time. Um, Lord, that we could look at, um, at, at these questions around suffering. And we looked at um, Nicodemus uh, when he came to you, Lord, um, with a question. Um, Lord, he didn't leave there without answer. But Lord, um, even though sometimes we don't hear, we don't understand the answer to the question, questions that we ask, um, Lord, but I pray this morning um, that you will move into our hearts and that you will answer the questions of our hearts, Lord. And often, Lord, um, it doesn't matter who we are, what we are, what we know, um, but Lord, when we come with a sincere heart like Nicodemus came, Lord, we will find the answers to the questions uh, that we have. But Lord, I pray for your uh, for you to bless us. Bless us today. Bless us in the week to come. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for allowing me into your, for allowing me to speak into your life today. Good morning, Numa fam. Um, we're going to move into a time of offering and announcements. We've been reading through Galatians and I just want to read this um, chapter for us here, this verse in chapter 6. It says, And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap, if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Um, and so in this letter, Paul is just encouraging the church to look after each other um, through doing good, um, through sowing and, and to not give up. Um, and so I just want to encourage us as well this morning 
to continue um, through our giving to look after one another. At Numa, we believe that God has called us um, to be givers of our time, of our talents, as well as our, our finances. Um, and so particularly in these times that we're in, let's continue to give um, so that we can look after our community, our families, um, and those around us. Um, I'll give over to Rizal for some announcements. So on that note, we just wanted to thank you for those that have been giving, um, financially giving, because we've been able to support Beth Uriel continuously throughout um, lockdown. Um, and that's just, I think, part of the reaping the fruits of giving. Um, and then we have our Alpha Groups. It'll be launching on that 3rd of August on Monday. And if you have any questions regarding your Christianity or faith, this is for you and you can DM us for any further details. So we hope you have a lovely day. Krayo, middag slaap jy in. Tot ziens. Tot ziens.